You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more information about the variety of topics covered on this show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stan, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. And if you enjoy this episode, please consider becoming a monthly donor to support my work and allow it to continue to go on and be free for all to access for as low as 99 cents a month. Visit the Support the Show link on my site's homepage for more information. Quick disclaimer, this was from July week 3. Due to some technical uploading errors, I'm just posting it now. But I do think the commentary and news updates I discuss are still quite relevant. So hopefully you still have some interesting takeaways and thoughts from this episode, even though the news may be a tad outdated. Just a heads up in case I use any dates or reference anything like tonight or tomorrow. Obviously, those terms do not apply anymore. And the news that has passed since this episode was recorded is included in another headline roundup I will be posting very soon. So this is just part of the latest K-pop news. I hope you enjoy the show and thank you for your patience and understanding. We have to start, of course, with the biggest and most exciting news of the week, maybe of the month, maybe of the year, all 13 members of Seventeen, a year early, decided to renew their contracts, so we get at least eight more years with Seventeen. It is just, what a beautiful day when I saw that news alert. I was overjoyed and not surprised. Of course I'm biased, but they really are a brotherhood, and I think This really brings home how much they really are a team, which is what makes them superstars. The statement confirming this news said, quote, Although their previous contracts have not yet expired, all 13 members of Seventeen and our company engaged in deep discussions on the future vision of the group that led to a clear consensus, enabling both parties to re-sign their contracts ahead of schedule. The members of Seventeen wish to explain the significance of the renewed contract and their determination for the future by saying that all 13 members agreed we will continue to be together in the trust and strong teamwork that we have developed over the years and as one team 17 we will continue to strive to bring great music and fantastic performances to fans around the world unquote Really, really, really wonderful news. And just a quick aside while we're talking about Seventeen, Wan Wu finally joined Instagram. And mark your calendars because July 30th, tune into Netflix Korea's YouTube channel for Soon Gwan, Vernon, and Mingyu's appearance on Quiz Alarm. In more great news for fans, SB19 had a really cool contest where they had fans design their logo. And they picked Karen May's design as the winning one. Very cool because not only is it a way to keep fans engaged in the fan idol relationship and feel like irreversibly devoted to the group to quite literally leave your mark in the fandom, but also that recognition generates great publicity for the band. I digress. I'll move aside from my economic, technical-minded self for a second to just enjoy the emotion behind this. So Karen's design is one of the best kind of logos, which is when it's deceptively simple. When it looks like anyone could draw that, but then you try and fail miserably. It's like the artwork for BTS's Love Yourself era covers. Looks simple, totally isn't. And that was the case with what she drew, which is a combination of a diamond and a windmill. And as often happens with K-pop logos, A lot of intent is put into every line in the logo, every detail. So she said she chose the diamond windmill fusion because, quote, a diamond will shine even with only a hint of light. A windmill will keep spinning as long as it's supported by the wind. SB19's fans are the light that makes SB19 shine. They are the wind that keeps SB19 going, unquote. All you need is a puff of wind to keep a pinwheel blowing essentially, and fans will make sure they are there to generate that energy for their faves. The one issue I have with this maybe is if she does not get any financial compensation for this, because my guess is this logo will be 
if it's official, it'll be used on t-shirts and other merch. So I hope she gets a cut of that, or at least gets to keep intellectual property rights over the logo, meaning she at least gets a say in however it's used. Speaking of issues I have with certain ways to keep fans' attention, I have some very complex feelings about the BTS Boston Dynamics Robots collaboration. And some of those concerns I had were indirectly mentioned through a Wired piece called Boston Dynamics, BTS, and Ballet, the next act for robotics. Some quick context. So BTS had an ad for Hyundai for the electric cars they have been sponsoring for that company. And their promo song for that Hyundai partnership is Ionic, I'm on it. That's the name of the song. So in this new video promoting the Boston Dynamics robot, dancing robot thing, You've probably seen it, even if you don't think you have. I bet you have. They sing a spoof of Ionic called Spots on it. Spot referring to the name of this robot dog. Before I dive into more of my specific take on this, let me just read from the piece. Quote, their capacity for robotic exactitude allows otherwise simple gestures. The lift of a head, a 90 degree rotation, the opening of Spot's mouth to create mirrored complexity across all of the robot performers, making it difficult to distinguish between the robot and at times it's unclear which robot head belongs to which robot body. The Spot robots are functionally, kinesthetically, and visually identical to one another. Human performers can play at such similitude, but robots fully embody it. It's Siegfried's uncanny swan valley amidst a robot ballet, unquote. Boston Dynamics said about this collaboration, quote, choreography is a form of highly accelerated lifestyle testing for their hardware, unquote. Translation, we're just testing out the abilities of our robots by making them complete choreography. It's for the advancement of their technology. Conveniently with the world's biggest possible sponsor. I'm of two minds about this. On one hand, whenever people freak out about a robot takeover or new technology, CGI, artificial intelligence, that kind of stuff, because it creeps them out. I like to encourage people to really think deeply about why it creeps them out. Sometimes people don't even really know why it just does creep them out. And if you don't have a good reason, maybe you're not open-minded. So I think probably my pro-artificial intelligence opinions are best laid out and explained in the early episode of How to Stand called Miku Holograms and a Redefining of Reality, which talked about how reality is actually more arbitrary and socially constructed than you'd imagine, and how places in other parts of the world, like Japan, they perceive reality differently. They don't view, for example, the puppeteer being on stage with the puppet as killing the illusion. They just accept it. It doesn't make the act feel less real to them. It's just part of the act to have the puppeteer on stage with the puppet. Likewise, if you have a virtual character or a hologram performing in Japan, it doesn't feel less quote-unquote real to them. They just don't conceptualize reality in that way. So that's what I try to keep in mind when people fear everything CGI and artificial intelligence, all that kind of tech. Because maybe just from a cultural standpoint, that is shaping your view more than you think and your open-mindedness to this more than you think. On the other hand, there are some big ifs here. And one of those is the fact that great, cool, interesting technology is also the kind of advanced technology that can be used for the wrong reasons, like the Boston Dynamics police dog that New York almost used before the backlash was so intense to have this artificial intelligence surveilling people that they shelved that idea. So in some ways it feels like, why are we making them do it when we can do this thing ourselves? Maybe we should work on improving human behavior as opposed to just passing off certain activities, relegating certain behaviors to tech? Then there's the issue of, in general, this, this hyper-consumerism-focused society because you've got ad on top of ad. 
you have the Hyundai song added to a video promoting Boston Dynamics. And then BTS is involved. It's a triple ad for three things at once. It's like someone mashed together two different ads. So at that point, it feels very overwhelming. <laughs> it feels like an overload. I guess the main purpose was accomplished. Because after all, I am talking about Boston Dynamics. And this word of mouth is what they wanted. I also think it's meant to gin up some good feelings about Boston Dynamics. And the potential for robots to look really cool performing in formations and stuff. So I think all of that intent was not accurately conveyed through this form that is so clearly commercialized. So I think that's my problem with it, is not their mission. I'm more sympathetic to their mission than I think some people are. But the execution of their goal was really making the whole concept feel way too fake and weird and if they took more of the commercial aspects away it was commercialized overkill to me and i think that's what the author of the wired piece was talking about really comparing putting boy band members alongside robots is a really weird awkward thing to do so the execution of this promo was not ideal but bts themselves promoting the robots i honestly don't have a problem with that the way I think some people jump to conclusions too, to not appreciate. Moving on to some less objectionable BTS news. They have been appointed as special presidential envoys for future generations and culture. This title was officially appointed to them by President Moon Jae-in. And now for the third time, BTS is set to attend the UN General Assembly. This will take place this year in September in New York, which is really interesting timing considering KCON on Twitter recently posted a cryptic tweet about, see you in September, maybe there's going to be a little KCON in-person event at some level in September, and BTS will just happen to drop in? I don't know, just throwing that out there. BTS got this role to, quote, lead the global agenda for future generations, such as sustainable growth and to expand South Korea's diplomatic power to match its elevated status. Final BTS update for now. Make sure to mark your calendars because July 27th, the BBC Radio will host BTS as live lounge performers. The following day, the 28th, there will be a BTS at Radio 1 30-minute documentary special. We've got the fan art, Boston Robots, Presidential Envoy Appointment, 17's Contract Renewals. We're already on story number five, which is mostly just an update, not a specific news event. We recently passed Bruce Lee's birthday, and I felt like it was only right to stop and reflect on his legacy a bit, because he has, outside of his martial arts and acting careers, really interesting philosophies and writings that I think also deserve more attention. And, you know, I had Kick It by NCT 127 in my head all day long on his birthday. So I feel like as an end citizen, we need to talk about the Bruce Lee shout out and why it is a good idea to give him some credit. And actually, Bruce Lee, I think it was just kind of a spur of the moment decision to reference him when the writers were working on the song Kick It. But... It would also make sense if he was intentionally chosen as the figure with a shout out, not just the martial arts theme of the song, Kick It, but because NCT is really about some of the same philosophies he lived by, about limitlessness, and about facing challenges and believing that you are superhuman and, and can stand up to the task. So a little bit about him before I share my favorite quotes from him. He was born in San Francisco in 1940, and he had been in over 20 films while he was still a child actor. And actually, he loves acting so much that as an adult, he paused filming one program to go film another. He just couldn't wait. So he paused filming Game of Death to go film Enter the Dragon, which is really funny out of context. He became the first Asian American actor in a leading role in a Hollywood movie. So although he was born in San Francisco, he did live in Hong Kong. When he came back to San Francisco in 1959, he had $100 to his name. 
He went on to study philosophy at the University of Washington, and then he popularized his own brand of martial arts as well, called Jeet Kune Do, which translates to way of intercepting fist, referring to no limitations. Jeet Kune Do is a type of martial arts still taught to this day, and three principles underlie it. Simplicity, directness, and freedom. Freedom in this context refers to a lack of a form. Limitlessness, you may have heard his famous quote about be like water. That's what he's talking about. Lack of form. Water takes the form of whatever container it's in, body of water, it's in whatever. And so you've got to just take in your surroundings and adapt to them. That's what he meant by freedom. He actually wasn't sure if he even wanted to give this new type of martial arts a name at all since that seemed ironic and to go against the whole principle of limitlessness, because the minute you name something, you limit it. You give it a title, and therefore there are also things that are not the title. Once you declare something as this, it's also automatically not that. But he also just needed a word to use to summarize his philosophy and describe what he was doing, so... He started using the term in 1967. And then the Tao of Jeet Kune Do was published in 1975. He died in 1973 after an allergic reaction to pain medication, and he was laid to rest in Seattle. He was only 32. What a life spent in just 32 short years. He got a lot of posthumous rewards from a Walk of Fame star to a congressional tribute in the House of Representatives to the Emma Legacy Award, Emma standing for Ethnic Multicultural Media Academy. That's actually where the Gandhi also got and MLK. I have three favorite Bruce Lee quotes. Absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. That one actually makes me think a little bit of NCT just in the fact that it feels like that's how they make their music. They absorb what is useful for them to work with musically, what's working for them aesthetically, sonically. They discard what they're not going to use, and they add a very, very unique NCT flair to what they do. Do not pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. No pain, no gain, and... Gotta be realistic, but optimistic is how I read that. And lastly, if you always put limits on everything you do, it will spread into your work and into your life. There are no limits. There are only plateaus, and you must not stay there. You must go beyond them. Once you put limits on what you think you can do in one area of your life, that mindset is going to infiltrate other sectors of your life as well, which can lead to feeling like you'll never be good enough in more than one area. It just spreads. A really interesting way to talk about cautious optimism and hard work and just how to exist and carry on. Really interesting and inspiring work of his. I will link to more sources about his life on my show's now monthly newsletter. Now let's get to some darker news for story number six. So as not to trigger any survivors, I will not be specifying certain things about this story, but you've probably heard by now, and if you haven't, you'll get wh what I'm trying to say by not saying it. So I'll try to avoid that, but I will issue a little trigger warning here that this story deals with an assault, possibly several, because someone came forward a 19-year-old on the news in China to say that the Chinese singer and former EXO member Chris Wu took advantage of her when she was 17. Not technically a minor there, the age of consent in China is actually just 14, but that's just a technicality. She also said during this NetEase interview that she knew of at least eight other people who were victims of his advances. She said she was coerced into drinking and blacking out and was then assaulted while she was there under the premise of auditioning for a program. She was allegedly paid over $77,000 in hush money, which she plans to return now that she's come forward. 
Chris Wu issued a statement basically saying all of this is untrue and, quote, if I've done any of the things she claims, I will take myself to jail, unquote. Chris is a rep for so many mega companies, like Porsche and Louis Vuitton level companies. And many of those have terminated their relationships with him in the wake of these allegations. But some, and he's an international rep, not just a rep in China for those companies, like Louis Vuitton, have just said things like, quote, they take allegations against Chris Wu very seriously and have suspended its relationship with Chris Wu until the outcome of the judicial investigation is known, unquote. So some have suspended their partnerships with him, others have already just terminated them, and many fans hope that this shaming continues, and this interview has already been watched over 1.6 billion times on the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. In a really weird plot twist, this other man was involved who apparently was just posing as a lawyer. So according to the police statement, he was caught on Sunday, July 18th. He was caught near Shanghai and arrested for defraudment. Chris Wu's mom called the cops to say, hey, we've been scammed. Because this guy apparently claimed that he had become Chris Wu's lawyer. And so for the legal fees, he asked for $77,000, which he got. Then he asked for $390,000 more, and that was an unsuccessful attempt. But before she got onto what was going on, she had sent $77,000. He also apparently, it sounds like he posed as the lawyer for the victim, too? So it's very weird. He's just kind of trying to get in on all of this. He did admit to his defraudment upon arrest, probably to get a lesser sentence. I will keep you posted with developments in that case. So those are the biggest buzzed about stories in the world of K-pop and C-pop this week. But let's get to a few more quick headlines from those worlds. Blackpink has a new collection of credit cards out that they help design. So in Korea, there's this company, BC Card, who has made 10 special credit card designs with Blackpink logos on them. Kaiko Entertainment and Melon Company are merging. That will be official, official, after an approval in a shareholders meeting September 1st. The implications for that merging, we can dive into into a future episode. I don't think from a consumer perspective, though, we're going to notice anything different. So I'm not going to dwell on the piece of news too much. Lots of COVID updates, some good, some really sad. San from ATs has fully recovered from COVID-19, so ATs can resume group activities now. Meanwhile, Minghyuk from B2B tested positive. He actually was in isolation due to his vocal coach testing positive earlier, and then soon after he tested positive while isolating. Jen Huan and Doyeon from Treasure both tested positive. Hani from EXID tested positive, and those interactions caused the ripple effect of XE from WJSN and Solbin from Laboom to both get tested. They both came up negative, though. More good 80s news today. Mingi is officially returning from his hiatus. Congrats to the rapper Sleepy, who announced he is going to get married very soon to a non-celebrity whose identity will remain private. Farewell to Shonu from Monsta X, who is officially entered the military for his required time there. Big congrats are in order for Aspa, who just signed with CAA, Creative Artists Agency. Just to be clear about this announcement, this is not a new American record deal or anything. This is not about music distribution or album sales, promo, etc. This is a talent agency that will help in other sectors of their career. Maybe modeling gigs in the USA, maybe that SM Cinematic Universe movie potential, acting gigs like that. More USA promo, but not music related necessarily. CAA is really big. They also rep Justin Bieber, Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, Beyonce, and actually Mark from GOT7 also recently gained rep from them. The Masked Singer Japan officially has a release date. 
It's coming to Amazon Prime Video September 3rd. Rock icon Miyavi will be a judge. Very excited for that, actually. Not a huge fan of the different versions of the show, but this one looks actually quite entertaining. The poster features this, I guess it's like a cross between a fish and a penguin, staring up at this mohawk-wearing creature flying in the air. It's a really fun poster. Anyway, JYP Entertainment has a new girl group debuting, and before they do, you can pre-order their debut single as what they're calling a blind package. So you can pre-order it already, having no idea what it will sound like, no detail. You just order something blank and see what happens. And that has sold over 40,000 copies so far. Over 40,000 pre-orders for a mystery package. Very interesting. I wonder if this success means they'll repeat that for future debuting groups. Entering the 1 Billion Spotify Streams Club, aka the Spotify Billions Club, 1OK Rock, and BTS, who are the first Korean act to join that list. Fake Love by BTS just got certified silver in the UK. Blackpink and Selena Gomez's collaboration Ice Cream just surpassed 400 million views. And Blackpink's Do 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 just surpassed 400 million streams, allowing them to become the only K-pop girl group with over 400 million total Spotify streams. More view count updates. Minzy's Tiamo just reached a million views reaching 10 million views, Soyeon with Beam Beam, and reaching 1.3 billion views. BTS and Halsey's Boy With Love. Side note, congrats to Halsey on her baby. Would love to see BTS become godparents. That is all for today, but please keep in mind that I have a lot more coming in the next few weeks. As I mentioned earlier, including a lot of thoughts I'll probably have on Astro's August comeback because to this day they have still not taken up my offer of a robot sci-fi concept. Astrobots. The marketing campaign writes itself, people. Speaking of the Boston robotics and everything today, just a timely reason to bring this up. I'm still dealing with the disappointment of SF9 and the movie F9, Fast and the Furious 9, for not having some sort of cross-marketing situation. It was right there for the taking. So anyway, let's make that happen for Astrobots someday. All right, marketing pitch is over. Headlines of the week over. Thank you all for listening to the show as always. Please rate and review it wherever you get the podcast. It really helps with my show's visibility. And I will talk to you all again super soon.